Okay, greetings everyone. Uh, this is Roberto Barrero. I'm the International Mechanisms Director for the U.S. Human Rights Network, and I'm uh, very happy that you can join us today for this uh, introduction to the ICCPR. And uh, we're going to get started uh, right away. Uh, we have about an hour. Uh, we have some great speakers. Uh, we will be opening up after the presentations uh, for questions. So um, please keep those questions in mind. Uh, after the presentations are done, um, we'll have uh, my colleague, Mac Burnett. He'll come on and explain how the questions, how we'll be taking questions, and uh, we'll move on from there. Uh, so today, uh, I'm just going to um, introduce our speakers in the order of their presentations. First, we'll have Mr. Jamil Dakwar, who's the director of the Human Rights Program for the American uh, Civil Liberties Union, or the ACLU. Elika uh, Vafai, I hope I pronounced that right, I'm sorry, uh, but she's the staff attorney uh, and program manager uh, for National Security and Civil Rights for Asian Americans Advancing Justice and the Asia Law Caucus. And finally, Sarah uh, Davila um, uh, Ruhak. Uh, she's the director of the International Human Rights Clinic uh, for John Marshall Law School. So, um, Jamil, please, whenever you're ready. Yeah, should I, Yoma? Has joined the meeting. Um, I, I want to first thank uh, Roberto for uh, the, the help in uh, preparing for this webinar, uh, the ICCPR task force members for uh, the help uh, for uh, uh, in, in preparing for this uh, uh, presentation, uh, including Elika and Sarah and others. Uh, I, um, I want to start with, uh, we have a PowerPoint that we presented. I hope it also will be recorded for those who will not be able to join today. Uh, the, the, really, the purpose of this, of this uh, webinar is to give you uh, both an introduction to the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also, more importantly, to give you an update on where we are in pre preparing for the United States review before the UN Human Rights Committee, and particularly because there is a, uh, a deadline that's coming up in January that we wanted um, all of you to be aware of and to start preparing for it. So let's get started uh, with, with the... Uh, um, with the webinar and the presentation. Let me just, uh, I hope you can all see the, the screen. Um, so what is the ICCPR? Um, it's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It came into effect in 1976. Um, it actually was negotiated after World War II, after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights meeting. was adopted, and it was one of the first international human rights treaties that was adopted by the United Nations. Uh, it, uh, it started uh, as, as a, uh, a civil political right uh, focus treaty. Uh, the United States ratified the treaty only in 1992. Uh, there are now 172 countries that ratified the treaties, uh, meaning they are fully uh, obligated to comply with the treaty. Um, and the, the ICCPR is a part of uh, a part of a what we call the International Bill of Human Rights that covers not just civil and political rights, but also covers social economic rights. Uh, it, it covers also other uh, specific treaties that were rat adopted by the United Nations over the years. But the ICCPR is a key fundamental treaty uh, with it's one of the three main treaties that the United States ratified. Uh, let's go through all the main ICCPR uh, key protections. Uh, we will be sharing after the call uh, the links to the ICCPR as a treaty. You can, you can uh, review it yourself. You will also be sharing some other resources that my colleagues will be going over. Uh, but for now, we just want to go uh, quickly over the different articles of the treaty just to give you a sense what, what this treaty protects uh, as a matter of human rights. Uh, first, uh, we look at the, the right to self-determination that is uh, uh, in, in the Article 1 which is, by the way, uh, similar to other key human rights treaties, Article 1 uh, is, is a co called Common Article 1 because it appears in all the other key human rights treaties, including the International Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights. Um, we have um, the, uh, then going through Article 2 that specifically talks about the, that, uh, the jurisdiction of the treaty, when it applies and how it should be uh, applied without distinction as to race, color, sex, language, religion, 
political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Note that the, the protected classes, so to speak, or the, uh, the not as inclusive as we have today because this treaty was adopted in the early 60s uh, and came into force in the 1970s. But um, uh, over the years, it, it covers a lot of the protected class, including discrimination against uh, uh, on, on the basis of sexu sexual orientation. Gender equality is particularly protected in Article 3. Um, then uh, the, R the ICCPR goes into specific rights that are in, uh, in, in, in embedded or in, uh, protected by the treaty, particularly Article 6 that protects the right to life uh, and particularly protection from arbitrary deprivation of life. Um, the, there's a specific language related to the use of the death penalty while the death penalty is not per se prohibited under the ICCPR it, uh, and should only be imposed for the most serious crimes uh, and definitely not for children. This is one of the articles where the, U the U.S. was uh, had to, and we will talk a little bit about it, had to, uh, to put forward the reservations to say that uh, at the time when we joined the treaty in 1992, the U.S. was still executing children, unfortunately, and that uh, meant that it was really violating this Article 6 beside the fact that we've also been practicing death penalty um, in a widespread manner. Um, there is a specific language around the right to seek pardon and, or commutation, uh, particularly if sentenced to death by the state. Uh, another article that covers uh, torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment that really covers all areas of deprivation of liberty, people incarcerated, whether it's in, in criminal uh, system, whether it's in the uh, administrative system of immigration or other kinds of setting where persons uh, are being deprived of liberty. There's a specific uh, uh, article, Article 7, that talks about the prohibition of torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment. Um, there are also specific um, uh, uh, prohibitions against uh, slavery and servitude. Um, that obviously is something that have been one of, again, the, the lessons of uh, post-World War II and the, 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 uh, the abolition movement had an impact on the human rights movement uh, and the treaties that were adopted. Article 9 covers the right to liberty and security of persons. Uh, then you have in Article 9, again, specific protections and safeguards uh, with regard to due process protections in arrest, in detention, and freedom from arbitrary detention in particular. Um, in Article 10, uh, which is uh, not too many, not too many people really know that this uh, this is really a central article uh, that protects the people the probability to be treated with humanity and with respect for the inherent dignity of human person. And the U.S. has not entered any reservations for this article. So, um, and, and you can imagine how many problems that we have with this particular article. Uh, the right to freedom of movement and the choice of residence is, is protected specifically in Article 12. And then we go to the equality and recognition before the law. Again, this is an important article uh, that actually spread in between Article 14 and Article 16 of the ICCPR. Um, when it comes to fair trials or trials, uh, there's a specific safeguards uh, in Article 14 that discussed fair trial rights and procedural gu guarantees for people who are uh, uh, facing trials. Uh, and then there's specific language around no ex post, ex post facto application of the law, meaning we cannot try somebody for a crime that was not specifically uh, um, uh, uh, already uh, outlawed or already specifically made prohibited under the criminal code. Uh, then there would be specific articles related to freedom of arbitrary or unlawful interference with privacy, family, or correspondence. This is the article that relates to surveillance matters, issues of, of, of tracking, monitoring, uh, illegally monitoring people. Um, and the, the article is, has a s several components, but the real main component is the right to privacy, which has been at the focus at the center of a lot of advocacy in the U.S. since the Edward Snowden revelations. Uh, then we have a specific article in regard to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And of course, Article 19, freedom of speech, right to hold opinions, and freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds. Uh, uh, there's an uh, important thing to, to mention here that the right to hold opinion is not subject to 
any kinds of uh, derogation, meaning any suspension of the obligation to protect that right, while some rights in the ICCPR are subject to this kind of temporary suspension. And, and we, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into that mechanism, but this is something that, that the uh, many countries, including the U.S., have invoked, although not formally under the U.S. Uh, uh, ICCPR obligations in at the time of emergency, what kind of rights uh, are should be protected no matter what, what kind of the circumstances. Um, moving to the prohibition of propaganda to war, advocacy of national and racial religious hatred that constitute incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. This is another area where the U.S. has, has had to enter uh, reservation, particularly in with regard to um, hate speech. Uh, then we have Article 21 that really um, uh, complement the other articles around uh, right to s free speech. Uh, this one, Article 21, protects the right to peaceful assembly. And freedom of association is also very related uh, to that matter. Uh, and in the last uh, few articles, we see the ICCPR addresses issues of marriage and family rights. Uh, again, a very important in this era where we see the attack on, uh, in, in the context of family separations. Uh, in general, there's a sense that, uh, you know, family is, uh, family rights is a conservative issue. Rather, here you see that the ICCPR, the hum key human rights treaty, protects the right to family unity. Um, and, and particularly also specific attention to children's rights, and that is before the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, was adopted by the UN. There's an Article 24 that protect, protecting of children's rights, including the right to national rights for children. Um, and then you go to the right I to participate in civil life, especially through voting and public service. This is one that uh, is, is really about voting rights, where there's a specific language around the, what kind of restrictions are allowed under the ICCPR to, to limit the right to, to vote or the right to participate in civil life. Um, and Article 27 relates to uh, rights of minorities, uh, particularly rights of ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities to enjoy their own culture or to profess and practice their own religion or to use their own language. Um, it's important to note that after the ICCPR was adopted in, uh, in the 1960s uh, and went into effect in 1976, there was a movement to, to push for the abolition of the death penalty and uh, for creating a mechanism where the Human Rights Committee the, that monitors compliance with the ICCPR will be able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to have, to see, to, to hear individual complaints about violations of, of the ICCPR. So the first optional protocol to the ICCPR establishes this ability of individuals uh, to bring uh, claims against uh, their own country if they have exhausted domestic remedies and they allege violation of the ICCPR. As of today, we have 116 countries that ratified the optional protocol. Unfortunately, the U.S. has not ratified so that we cannot bring individual communication, individual complaint against the U.S. for violation of the ICCPR before the UN Human Rights Committee. Um, and similarly, the U.S. has not ratified the second optional protocol of the ICCPR that deals with uh, abolishing the death penalty. Uh, as of today, we have 86 uh, state parties or countries that have adopted this, uh, the, this protocol, which means that they should, uh, they are prohibiting and they took on their, themselves the obligation not to use a death penalty. Uh, let's quickly just go over the, with the U.S. ratification, it w did not come without any conditions and uh, qualifications. So the U.S. Uh, used a system that is commonly permissible under international law, the use of reservations, understandings, and declarations. Usually uh, the acronym is RUDS. And for that purpose, the U.S. said, we are uh, going to ratify this treaty, but we, we have some certain conditions, or we go, we're going to make it clear that we, we, we are not going to adopt uh, or accept certain protections, certain obligations that are, um, that are included in the ICCPR, and, and certain articles we have a, our own understanding of what, what the protections mean. So let's go quickly over them. Um, the first, uh, the, the, uh, there were five reservations, five understandings, and three declarations that were made by the U.S. Let's start with the reservations. Uh, first of all, the first reservation was 
the, that, the, that the protection of free speech under the U.S. Constitution is the way that the United States agrees to Article 19 uh, that protects free speech, which in the United States uh, uh, sees as more expansive than what the, the ICCPR provides. The second thing, as I mentioned earlier, right to impose capital punishment on any person uh, other than pregnant women, including juveniles. That was, again, this reservation is what entered when the U.S. ratified the treaty in 1992 before the U.S. Supreme Court um, abolished the use of the death penalty against uh, minors or children. And unfortunately, this reservation is still uh, still there and, and it was never withdrawn from the United States uh, um, Senate or government. And the third one, uh, limiting the prohibition against cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment to the uh, constitutional protections or prohibition under the 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendment. Uh, that's very important reservation and, and, and very damaging, I would say, uh, reservation because it, it basically says to the, to the international community, the U.S. says, uh, we are not going to adopt uh, more protections, uh, more prohibitions against torture that are included in Articles um, 7 of the ICCPR uh, with regard to um, uh, banning the cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment or punishment. We will only accept this obligation as long as it's consistent with the constitutional prohibitions that we take, uh, or we, know, we understand under the U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence under the 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendment, where the 8th Amendment specifically is the, the key prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. Um, the, the fourth reservation is limits uh, the treatment of juveniles as adults in the criminal justice system. As many of you know, uh, this is where the U.S. is really an outlier and, and, and out of step with the rest of the world in the way that we treat our juveniles and children, treat them as adults. This is something that continues to be the case in many states, and, and that, is, that is why the U.S. has to enter as a reservation to protect a lot of the state's uh, criminal justice systems that allow this, this abhorrent practice. Uh, uh, to continue. And then let's go to the, quickly to the understandings. Uh, the, the first understanding was that the treaty, meaning the ICCPR, shall be implemented by the federal government to the extent that it exercises legislative and judicial jurisdiction over the matters covered by the treaty and otherwise by the state and local government, but with support from federal government for the fulfillment of the covenant. In other words, what the U.S. government said in this understanding is that we, as a federal government, we cannot uh, uh, make make a fully uh, make take our the obligations of the federal government uh, uh, over uh, matters that are within the jurisdiction of state and local governments. But we we will support the federal uh, the state and local government in the fulfillment of the covenant. Uh, that is not what is expected from government when government join, whether it's a federal system or not. They are obligated to protect all the rights in the in the treaty, in the Human Rights Treaty, in this case the ICCPR, at all level, the federal, state, and local level. U.S. government, because of its federal system, had to enter this understanding. Um, the, the declarations that were included uh, uh, quickly, the United States declares that the provisions of Articles 1 through 27, meaning all the substantive articles related to the different rights that we, we went over earlier, are not self-executing. Uh, and that is uh, meaning that they are not, they are not uh, in a, a automatically will be enforced in a in a court of law. They need to be there need to be um, enabling legislation in order to effectuate our ICCPR treaty obligations. And that means that we can't really go to court and in, and say I have a, I have a violation of the ICCPR and I'm seeking a direct remedy from state or federal court for the for the violation of the treaty, even though. The treaties, ratified treaties on the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution, are in par with the federal law, uh, and yet, because of uh, the doctrines of the U.S. Supreme Court over the years, uh, treaties that are not self-executing, um, they will not be automatically enforceable in a, in a court of law. Um, just last qu uh, quick comment here: the U.S. Congress has never really implemented, fully implemented the ICCPR. The U.S. Uh, has taken uh, very little, if any, steps to pass legislation to look at the gaps, and that's one of the reasons why we are using this mechanism in order to uh, to push the United States and in, in, in moving forward uh, 
uh, to close the gap between what the U.S. law is and what the treaty obligations uh, require. Uh, let's move to the, the process. So the U.S. is obligated under the treaty to provide periodic reporting to the committee, to the UN Human Rights Committee, that is made up of 18 uh, experts, independent human rights experts. This human rights committee is not the same as the UN Human Rights Council, which is a, another entity of the United Nations, but is more political entity that represents states. The UN Human Rights Committee uh, is a, a body that has 18 independent human rights experts nominated by the states, elected by the governments, but they act in their personal capacity. They do not represent their, their, uh, their own government. The U.S. does not have a representative currently or someone from the United States on the Human Rights Committee, um, but for years since the U.S. ratified or joined the ICCPR, there was always a, a, an independent expert uh, from the United States who, who joined. Usually the independent experts uh, for, do not uh, participate in the review of their own country. Uh, but more importantly, we want to give you a, an update on where, where the U.S. review is. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, fourth periodic report was submitted, uh, the last one was submitted in December of 2011. The last review before the committee was held in March 2014. Some of you may have taken uh, part in that process. Uh, uh, the Human Rights Committee that I mentioned earlier that monitors compliance with the ICCPR had a, a review for the U.S. where the U.S. got sent a delegation uh, of uh, interagency delegation in, that also had included some um, two or three state local government uh, uh, governments uh, to Geneva in order to defend and pr to present its its periodic report. And that review happened in in March of 2014. After that review, the U.S. issued uh, what they call a concluding observations, a set of recommendations and findings where the U.S. is doing well, where, where there's much progress made to implement the treaty, and they highlight areas of concern, areas where the U.S. needs to, to, to do more in order to comply with the treaty. In 2015, there was another set of recommendations that was made by the committee uh, as part of the one-year follow-up uh, uh, to the 2014 review and recommendations. And again here, the committee expressed concern and, and actually gave the U.S. a very low grade over its implementation of these five areas that were highlighted in the, in the report. We will be uh, providing the resources directly to links to these reports so you can see what exactly was said by the committee um, in both the 2014 and 2015. And, and more recently, the United States accepted a new reporting procedure where the report is submitted based on the list of questions. So before, in the past, up to 2014, um, the, the, the U.S. report would be submitted and then the, the, US, the U.N. committee would issue a list of questions. And that list of questions will be the basis for the review between, or the dialogue, as it's called, between the committee members and the U.S. government. And now, after the U.S. accepted this new reporting protocol, the U.S waits until the committee issues its list of questions or list of issues that are really represent the focus of, of what the review is going to look like before it starts to draft its own, re, uh, its own report, the periodic report. In this case, would be the fifth periodic report. So we are in a, in a, in a place now where uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, accepted that procedure, and we will go over with the, with the timeline. Um, I'm going to skip those, uh, the ICCPR task force. I think we, we, everybody knows that the, this is a task force of the U.S. Human Rights Network was created in order to, co to coordinate this process, and, and we, uh, we can say more about it in the Q&A. I just want to go through uh, the more important operative parts. Uh, so what will happen next? Uh, we have an opportunity for organizations, uh, activists, grassroots organizations, national, state, and local groups that are working on human rights in the United States to inform the committee about main or issues of concern where the U.S. is not uh, fulfilling its obligations under the International Human Rights Treaty, uh, that is the ICCPR. Uh, the committee opened the opportunity for NGOs, for non-governmental organizations, uh, but essentially anybody can really uh, provide information, credible information to the committee to say that the U.S. is not 
um, uh, is not implementing or fully implementing or violating the, in the Civil Political Rights Treaty. And the deadline for that, uh, for NGOs to submit information and materials to the Human Rights Committee is coming up in January 14, 2019. We'll go a little more, my colleagues will cover what that would look like uh, in terms of the, the resources that we developed as a, as a, as a network task force. Um, in March 2019 uh, will be the 125th session of the, of the committee that will be held in Geneva, uh, where again, NGOs will be invited if they can travel, if they have the ability to travel to Geneva, to present additional oral briefings uh, to the committee members and lobby committee members on a list of questions, list of issues and concern, provide alternate uh, analysis of why uh, the committee should take up these kind, these issues uh, and include them in the list of questions that will be sent to the U.S. government before the government drafts its own uh, periodic report. So that will happen in March 2019. Uh, there are, we don't know exactly the date that the, the, the briefings will take place in Geneva, but will, that will be provided in the next few weeks. Then uh, in March 2020, uh, one year from the adoption of the list of questions, the U.S. fifth periodic report will be due to be submitted to the Human Rights Committee. Um, um, it's, uh, there's one year gap between the time that the committee issues its list of questions to when the U.S. is obligated to provide that report. Um, again, the, the, the U.S. Uh, can delay that beyond to 2020, but that is that would be the deadline of an expectation that the U.S. will, will meet that deadline. And then the actual review before the committee is likely to take either either sometime in late in the 2020 or uh, sometime in 2021. Again, it depends on the schedule of the Human Rights Committee because the committee reviews uh, reports from from uh, from many many other countries that are party to the ICCPR. So we don't know what would that whether that will be in 2020 later in that year or it will go into 2021. Uh, right now, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to my colleague uh, Sarah, who will be talking more about the the list of clusters and thematic issues that we're thinking as a as a task force to 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 organize around. Sarah, thank you, thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is a very exciting opportunity for um, organizations that have submitted um, list of issues or reports to the Human Rights Committee relating to. U.S. compliance with the ICCPR or for new NGOs um, who are looking to, to submit um, about the work that they're doing on the ground or uh, nationally. So we have created a, um, a couple of tools that you can use um, when you're trying to think about how to even approach um, preparing the reports, thinking about the issues, how do they fit into this framework that the ICCPR provides. So one of the tools that um, we have Has joined the meeting. and um, were used in the past is this NGO list of issues. Um, and so there's a screenshot right there of what the document look like, looks like. Um, as you can see, um, the, we have identified some issue areas that um, are sort of helpful um, for you to use. Um, so the thematic clusters are really sort of broader issue areas um, that really mirror the ICCPR and Jamil just went through um, the, some of the main provisions of the ICCPR with the corresponding articles. Um, and so when you're thinking about um, preparing these reports, think about what are sort of the broader issues or thematic clusters under which um, sort of your work fits in. And so um, as uh, Jamil mentioned, self-determination is sort of one of the most important in uh, most uh, human rights treaties. And so you will see from this list that um, equal protection and non-discrimination are sort of very broad uh, topics, the same with um, freedom from torture or cruel and human and or degrading treatment. Um, freedom of movement, access to justice, expression, association, and participation. So um, when you're thinking about the particular issues that you work on, you can think about how those fit into those thematic uh, clusters. Um, so this slide is um, uh, examples from actually the last 
attached um, list of issues that were submitted to the Human Rights Committee. Um, here are some of the issues that were submitted under the sort of thematic cluster of equal protection, discrimination, and racial profiling. And so as you can see from the list, um, it, they look very differently, right? So the domestic violence against women or stop and frisk practice or solitary confinement um, or religious persecution or anti-immigration uh, policies. And so when you're thinking about your work, think about how they fit into these thematic clusters. So you can use, and we encourage you to think about how your work may touch upon um, multiple thematic clusters. So for example, um, if you are working on a right to water or environmental um, harm or um, the right to a healthy environment, um, other and actually a variety of rights um, are affected. So for example, if your report is on environmental harm, most likely you might have a right to life argument, equal protection and non-discrimination, access to justice and freedom of expression um, if the right to information sort of fits into that framework. And so um, we're going to circulate um, the document that was in the screenshot for you to, to have access to it and look at, but feel free to add um, sort of new sub-issues um, under those clusters. And think about how your work um, sort of can fit into the different ones. And so don't feel like yours has to fit into just one, um, but you can sort of include them in a variety of clusters. Um, so now I'm gonna sort of turn it over to Elika, and Elika will talk about um, uh, other resources that are available to you um, through the US Human Rights Network and ICCPS, ICCPR Task Force. Great. Um, thank you so much. And so, yes, we uh, wanted to provide several resources that are available to help guide folks through the process, particularly because this is a process that can be accessible and easy for folks across all different sectors working on a variety of issues, whether nonprofits or activists have been active in this process before or not. So really welcoming folks from a variety of fields, even if they haven't engaged in this process or with the ICCPR before, so that we get a really robust representation in this process. Um, so first, uh, thank you to Jamil for leading this process, but we have a template for the list of issue submission to the UN Human Rights Committee that can be found on the US Human Rights Network website. And of course, we'll be emailing out the link to this as well. Um, but really wanted to create a template so that folks know for that due date in January 14th what it should actually look like. I'm going to just verbally cover some of the questions um, in that template, um, but again, please do look it over and you'll have all our contact information at the end should there be any questions about the template. So what will we do is this um, list of issues submission template to the committee. It's really just a two to three page document. Um, and the submission is essentially a short summary of issues that we're recommending to the committee to include as Jamil broke down. So, you know, there will be um, a number of different sections, some just informational pieces, you know, for example, a, a brief description of the types of organizations or the coalition that are submitting um, the uh, template for the list of issues. So that falls into the thematic clusters that Sara broke down. Um, a summary of the issues, right? So briefly summarizing in one to two paragraphs, the different human rights issues specifically that the submission is going to address. Of course, there's a section on, you know, how this ties to the ICPR legal framework. But of course, the template does have bullets that you can follow. Um, the template also includes a section on the current U.S. government policy or practices. And so really summarizing the current the policy meeting. and practice, and particularly any changes since 2014, since that's the time period that we're focusing on right now. Um, the template does have a section for links to any general comments that the, U, that the Human Rights Committee has issued on this topic in the past. 
and we did include a link for you to go through and to see where those comments are. Um, a section on any UN body recommendations, so if there are any applicable links um, con to concluding observations, final recommendations, um, anything along those lines, um, to feel free to add str um, any st other strong recommendations from other human rights bodies, for example, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. A key section of the template is also, of course, the recommended questions, right? So listing in order of priority, two to three questions that you recommend the Human Rights Committee ask the U.S. government, and finally, in order of priority, two to three recommendations um, to suggest to the Human Rights Committee to provide the U.S. government upon review. It sounds like a lot, but it's actually just a two to three page submission. Um, and so please do look at that template that we sent out and, and of course let us know if you have any questions. In terms of other resources that are available, um, we're really fortunate to have advanced law students at the Northeastern Law School's U.S. Human Rights Advocacy Seminar that are available to work with organization and activists that can help you fill out this, um, you know, do the background research for the submission to help draft language to further, you know, develop the submission and, and be in consultation with you as organizations and as activists. If this is a resource you'd like to take advantage of, which we strongly recommend and are very excited about, please do contact Professor Martha Davis. Um, the email is in the PowerPoint, which we'll be sending out. And please do contact her as soon as possible and no later than December 14th. Finally, of course, there is the general US, U.S. Human Rights Network ICCPR website. There are a range of resources about the ICCPR generally, and there will be also the ACLU FAQs, which will be updated on the U.S. Human Rights Network uh, website, which you're now seeing on, on the webinar. So of course, you know, please do use these resources because we do think that they will help facilitate an easier lift for activists and organizations across the range of issues that we really want to highlight. And all of our contact information is available and the clinic is available. So please do let us know if we can be of further assistance to you. And with this, I will pass it over to Roberto. Thank you so much uh, to everyone. Uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we will be opening up for questions uh, in just a moment. My colleague, Mac Burnett, will be coming on just to tell you how uh, we'll go forward with that. Uh, I do see, Mac, that we have one question already in the chat, so maybe you'll you want to uh, read that one out and then uh, explain to folks how, how we'll be going forward with the other questions. Mac, uh, can you... Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Roberto. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Mac Burnett. I'm a communications consultant with uh, U.S. Human Rights Network. Uh, please just type your questions into the chat box, and we will bring you guys on. If you don't want to come on, that's fine. You can just type your question in the Q&A box, um, either, and I'll read it out to the, the panel, and the panel will uh, come on, and they'll answer your questions. Um, you can also raise your hand, and I'll also be able to know that you are interested in asking a question. Uh, and then I'll unmute you, you can ask your question, and then I will re-mute you and allow the panel to answer. So please feel free to put your questions in. So I'm going to read the first question from uh, Alexander. He says, do we need to know that an issue is a nationwide problem in order to submit it for the list of issues? For example, my organization works in New York City on some of the issues displayed on the earlier list stop and frisk, unlawful eviction of public housing, et cetera, but we're less knowledgeable about these issues outside of New York City. So I'll, I'll put that back to the panel. Anika, you want to go or Sarah? Sure. So you don't have to be an expert at the national level. I think what is most interesting about NGO participation in these submissions is bringing your area of work and your experience um, because really what we want is an inclusive process where we hear a variety of voices of what is actually going on the ground. And that's really the value. So if you see that you're doing something in your community 
that um, is happening and it's in violation of the ICCPR, then bring that and I um, encourage you to write a report. And so, and also don't feel like you have to mirror what other organizations doing similar work do, right? Um, I think the experiences um, of local and grassroots organizations are so um, important in this process. Okay, Alexander said thank you. And uh, Kate Kelly asked, will there be an effort to organize groups submitting questions on the same theme or topic? So if I can also take this. So um, the document that I um, talked about, which is titled NGO List of Issues, um, will be in the U.S. Human Rights Network. And um, you will be able, as an NGO or advocate, you will be able to sort of uh, send in the information on what you're hoping to submit or what you will submit um, so that we can coordinate and see um, who else is submitting on similar or the same issues. Awesome, any other questions? Uh, the, the raise hand function may or may not be working, so if anybody just types in the chat or the Q&A, uh, I'll be happy to bring you out to ask a question. Uh, I can make you, uh, uh, I can unmute you and you can say what you want to say or you can just type it in. All right, let's see if we have any more questions. Okay, I don't see any more questions. I guess we'll give it a few minutes. Uh, if you guys have any closing words, uh, maybe you guys can do that while anyone are, are, is uh, thinking about questions. Maybe you guys can do that now. Oh, here's a question. We have a question. Uh, if you're going to submit on multiple issues, is it better to submit them together or separately from the same organization? Anything to keep in mind in this regard? Have a good day. I can take that one. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, yes, there, there's a different ways that you can do it. Uh, one, the committee uh, doesn't necessarily say, you know, or uh, limit the number of submissions or the, uh, the way that organizations or NGOs should make them. But from experience, uh, what we found is that when uh, groups come together and submit uh, joint submissions uh, where they can uh, avoid of any unnecessary duplication or overlap uh, and, and kind of be more uh, specific and kind of speak uh, as, a, as a group, uh, as a number of organizations coming together, it, it, it sends a stronger message to the, to the committee that this is really an issue that's not just a, a concern for one organization, uh, but it's really a, a, a number of organizations came together and and highlighted that issue and, and the concern or the questions and, and provided information in that way. But there are also um, limitations to how much you can do join. If you are a multi-issue organization, for example, my organization at ACLU is a multi-issue organization. We have interest in providing information in a number of areas, not just, just one issue area. Um, in the past, there are certain, uh, several submissions were made by organizations that have uh, included the different areas of concerns or questions. Uh, but what we try to do is to coordinate between those different submissions so that, again, to avoid any, uh, any kind of uh, redundancy and, and, and covering at, at the very, uh, as much as we can the different aspects of the issue so that we, or the different articles and issues that we, we think the committee will be, uh, will be able to address uh, throughout this process. So the suggestion would be if you were able to coordinate with other organizations, do that, uh, try to come together. Uh, we are offering a chance for organizations to lead uh, the coordination uh, around certain cluster issues uh, that, that Sarah went through uh, the list. Uh, we, if you're if you're doing your own submission, it would be great to to let the the leaders of the clusters or the working groups of those clusters know that you will be covering the the the, the issue in your multi-issue submission, so that they are aware and they can they can at least some there will be some level of coordination um, and as as these are brought to the attention of the committee. Ultimately, these submissions will be made public. Uh, both at the network, at the U.S. Human Rights Network website, 
Uh, I know that the network is, is revamping its web, website and it will be a new website. We'll host a lot of resources that we went through today, but also the actual submissions. And then the Human Rights Committee will have all the, sub, the submissions that were made uh, will be made public, will be posted on the website of the committee. Uh, and they, I think they post them at the, based on the uh, uh, either alphabetically or the, the, the date when, when the, com the submission was made. So uh, we will again provide uh, the link to the when, when those lists of submissions will start to be listed so that uh, you also will, will see them. Uh, more important to keep in mind is the deadline is the 14. The committee will not accept submissions after the 14. That's a really a strict deadline. Uh, they, they, will, uh, sub they will receive information uh, as they send them, uh, I think the limit for each submission is up to 10,000 words. We think that you, you don't have to, to, to make the submission if it's a one issue area. Um, use the, the whole 10,000 words if you can be succinct, if you can be really brief. Uh, in the template that, that Elika talked about, we're, we're proposing two to three pages for per issue. I mean, obviously, if you really need more space, you can do that. but. But I think this, the, 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 the shortened they are, I think, and the brief they are, and the, to the point they are, uh, I think it will be really helpful for the committee members because they will, we will have not just the U.S. Uh, materials to read. They will have other countries to read. They, they, will be, um, they will really appreciate if we are as brief as possible. Okay, okay. I have a question. I will answer the first one. Uh, the first one is, can we get the materials, please, if we were late? Everyone should have been emailed uh, the materials earlier. In the event that you did not get that URL or you'd like me to manually send it, you can just uh, put a one in the chat. I'll make a note of it, and I will manually send, uh, I'll manually send you the materials after the webinar. But, yes, these will all be available. Aliyah also asked, she said she missed the first part due to technical difficulties. When is the deadline for submission of shadow reports for ICCPR and CAT? Well, uh, uh, the, the deadline, this is not the deadline for the shadow reports because as, as uh, you, 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 because you missed the first part, we, uh, we explained that the procedure for the U.S. review before the ICCPR Human Rights Committee's monitoring body uh, is different this time. Uh, the committee is inviting us, inviting a, a civil society organizations to submit information for them to use to come up with a list of questions before the committee, before the U.S. starts to draft their own report. So we are not talking about a full shadow report because the U.S. government report is not available. It's not been drafted yet. Uh, there will be time in, in, in maybe a, um, a couple of years after we see the U.S. report and before the U.S. appears before the committee um, that then we will be discussing how to, uh, to draft shadow reports. But the deadline for the, the submission of uh, brief submissions for the list of questions, list of issues is January 14, 2019. Um, and we, we provided a template that you will find uh, in the uh, in the email that will be sent as a follow-up to this webinar, where we will, we will be able to 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 see the uh, both the details of when to send it, how to send it, and how to work with other organizations if you uh, if you're interested to co coordinate around that issue. In terms of the CAT, the Committee Against Torture or the Convention Against Torture uh, review process is a separate one. Um, the U.S. report was due this month, or last actually last last week uh, in November. Uh, as far as we know, the report hasn't been submitted yet. So the, again, the process for that uh, review process is a separate one and will, will, will really um, uh, depend on when the U.S. report will be submitted and when the committee will be scheduled the report for review. Uh, and the network has a separate task force on the Convention Against Torture um, and will be uh, providing that information to you all. Awesome. Uh, Basima asks, can, uh, can we submit as a single organization or group, or can we submit jointly? To clarify, the reports can be submitted by a single organization group or can be submitted jointly. Uh, I think we, we, uh, we, uh, we covered that already, but I was emphasize it could be both either uh, a group of organization, a group submission, a coalition submission, 
that will be signed on by different different organizations, or you can submit it individually, independently as your organ or your own organization. Uh, we, 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 there's a lot of pluses, a lot of advantages in doing uh, joint submissions, especially if you're working on an issue that you're already in touch with, with other community organizations, with other advocacy organizations, and you, you already have a coalition, so you, instead of starting everything from scratch, you really, uh, we're, we're proposing is that you use the tools that we offer, the template, as a way to bring people together to decide what are the issues that you want to bring to the committee, how, what kind of information that will be needed? How do you furnish that information? How do you provide it? And what are the specific questions that you're recommending for the committee to raise um, uh, to, the U, to the U.S. government? Uh, that, again, it's, it's up to you. I don't know if Elika or Sarah, you have other, other things to add to this. Okay, I think we have time for two or three more questions. Uh, if anyone has any uh, last questions, um, if not, I am going to. I'll give it a few uh, seconds here. Um, again, if you did not receive the materials, please put a one in the chat, and I will manually send you the materials uh, immediately after this uh, webinar. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Roberto for any uh, closing uh, statements. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Max. And again, uh, I want to thank everyone for participating in this webinar today. It's been a real pleasure uh, for the U.S. Human Rights Network to facilitate uh, this dialogue uh, on the ICCPR and on behalf of the ICCPR uh, task force. So if you uh, go to the U.S. Human Rights uh, U.S. Human Rights Network website, uh, you can get some more information on how you can part actually participate in the task force moving forward. Uh, as Jamil mentioned, we are in the process of revamping the website, so it'll look uh, very differently in the coming weeks. But uh, please uh, view the website as a resource to come for the materials, for updates on the process, especially the coordination process. Uh, Forward. So uh, once again, I want to thank our distinguished speakers uh, who gave excellent presentations and, and worked uh, hard uh, to put this webinar together. And uh, we apologize for any technical issues that might have happened, but uh, thank you again so much, Jamil, Elika, Sara, uh, for all your work in, in making this happen. And also want to give thanks to my uh, U.S. Human Rights uh, Network colleague, uh, Max Burnett, for providing the technical support for today. As he mentioned, uh, he can send the materials that we have posted here. And uh, moving forward, please uh, check the U.S. Human Rights Network website. And we look forward to engaging all of you in this process moving forward. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Next. day. Has left the meeting. A participant has left the meeting. A participant has left the meeting.